So for more than 30 years, the world has talked about greenhouse gas emissions and the environmental, social, and economic stresses that they cause. In spite of the science, physical evidence, and widespread agreement that the world needs to act, our global success has been surprisingly modest. More than 80% of the world's energy still comes from fossil fuels. Each year, our consumption of fossil fuels grows. Each year, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases. Each year, there are more extreme weather events. And we've seen this over and over in Alberta. This is our reality in the 21st century. One might have expected better results since the International Panel on Climate Change started reporting on climate change back in 1990. But in retrospect, there are reasons for society's tepid response further to the question that was just put. For starters, climate, climate science is complex. Most people just don't have the time or the energy it takes to drill down and make sense of it all. Instead, they take direction from people they trust, and over the years, this direction has sometimes been confusing. In the end, a lot of people have simply tuned out. Add to this, most people are cautious when it comes to any kind of change. Studies show we prefer the status quo as a species, even when we are presented with better options. Unfortunately, this basic human instinct gets in the way of many of the positive changes that are available today for addressing energy and climate challenges. On top of all of this is the widely held belief that climate change won't affect us in our own lifetimes and that whatever we do as individuals is just too small to matter. So with all this inertia, what will it take to get things moving? In the coming decades, as the effects of climate change become more and more apparent, I have no doubt the global community will finally shift into high gear. The difficulty, though, with this wait-and-see approach is that we continue to lose precious time. Ongoing delay will allow CO2 concentrations to rise, and these dangerous levels will be with us for decades or centuries to come. Now, former Royal Dutch Shell CEO Jeroen van der Veer said, and I quote, how can I prepare for or even shape the dramatic developments in the global energy system that will emerge in the coming years? This question should be on the mind of every responsible leader in government, business, and civil society. End quote. I agree with Mr. van der Veer. Questions about the world's energy sustainability need to be front and center. They must be on the minds of government, business, and civil society leaders like you, me, and everyone in this room. We have a role in advancing the discussion and in leading the change. The purpose of conferences like this is to explore ideas on how we perform this role, this obligation, more effectively. So there are three messages that I want to share with you today about Edmonton. The first is that Mr. Van der Feer's question is very much on the minds of my City Council colleagues. We understand that the global energy system is changing and that Edmonton needs to be prepared for these changes. Our commitment is outlined in the City's Environmental Strategic Plan, which we call The Way We Green in which City Council has set goals for Edmonton to become an energy sustainable, energy resilient, and carbon neutral city. When it comes to energy and climate, our vision is clear. My second message is that I'm an optimist. I am optimistic the world will start responding to its energy and climate challenges in a more timely and urgent manner. I am optimistic that Edmonton can be the nation's leader in this field. And I am absolutely convinced that becoming a low-carbon city will give Edmonton and like-minded cities social and economic advantages in addition to the environmental dividends. Climate change has presented us with a very compelling reason to learn, to innovate, and to advance human society to a higher quality of life with lower environmental impact. This is not doom and gloom. This has to be opportunity. My third message is that over the past 30 years, an amazing culture of sustainability has taken root here in Edmonton. Today, we are an environmental leader on many fronts, and I'll tell you about a few of them. But this positions us well for the energy and climate challenges that lie ahead. We are not starting from zero. 
Perhaps we're best known for our innovative waste management solutions. Only 27 years ago, we dealt with residential waste the way most North American cities did, by burying it in the ground. Today, we divert up to 60% of it from the landfill, and we are aiming for 90% when our new biofuel plant comes online this summer. 90% diversion. How did we come so far and so fast? Well, like climate change, it started with a problem that needed fixing. At the time, we called it the landfill crisis. The city-owned landfill was nearly full, and the search for a new one was not going well. In the end, it was Edmontonians who saw the opportunity and called for a fresh approach. City administration responded with curbside recycling program in 1988. A municipal composting facility came next. Education programs were launched to encourage citizen participation. Eco stations sprang up, giving Edmontonians a safe and convenient way to dispose of their household hazardous waste to keep it out of the other waste stream. Now, before long, people were coming here from around the world, and they still do, to learn about Edmonton's successes. Indeed, we have one of North America's highest volunt uh, voluntary recycling rates. We're even capturing landfill gas to generate enough electricity for 4,600 homes and capturing that dangerous methane gas that would otherwise be released to the atmosphere. Even our grass cycling participation rate, which is cut it and leave it on the lawn rather than bag it up and ship it out to, to the city, went from 30% to 60%. Edmontonians are bought in. Now, as our culture of sustainability grew, we witnessed more and more environmental initiatives running in parallel including a larger and healthier urban forest and greater protection of natural areas and biodiversity in our city, more bike lanes and walking infrastructure for active transportation, expanded efforts to recycle concrete and asphalt for reuse and road projects, rapid uptake of energy-efficient LED streetlights, increased emphasis on developing transit-oriented communities, more residential and commercial infill, improved energy efficiency of city buildings and vehicles, continued improvement of our water, uh, wastewater and stormwater systems, and more strategies to reduce stormwater runoff through the use of plants, soils, and permeable surfaces, low-impact development practices. And the list goes on. So as you can see, Edmonton and, most importantly, Edmontonians have a track record of doing things first. In fact, one of these once-in-a-lifetime milestone opportunities is in front of us right now. Late last year, the city center airport closed to make way for a pioneering project we call Blatchford, which is what the airfield was once called, just a few kilometers north of where we're standing or sitting or standing, as the case may be here today. With the vision of a carbon neutral community that uses 100% renewable energy, Blatchford is an urban development opportunity in our core that is rarely presented to any city. Blatchford is the right opportunity and we are at the right time in our city's evolution and maturity to do something bold and to continue Edmonton's doing things first DNA in that tradition. But we need to do it right. This means fulfilling the Blatchford vision set out by City Council, which is an affordable lifestyle for Edmontonians at every stage of life. Housing options for Edmontonians and their families, efficient, affordable and reliable transit and active transportation options, a place, ultimately, where Edmontonians can live, work, learn, and play, and where it's easy to adopt a sustainable lifestyle. We have one and only one chance at doing this right. Raising the bar for sustainable communities is one of a handful of developments around the world that, that we can accomplish here. Meeting today's t uh, targets will, be, will set tomorrow's benchmarks. We will face, in fact, we are already facing pressure from competing interests that threaten to take us away and deviate from Blatch Blatchford's original vision. Just consider the opportunity cost of watering down a project like this is vision and integrity. Indeed, we can strike a balance. Let's learn from our past, where development decisions were compromised repeatedly and where, as a result, our reputation suffered. I hear this from business and community leaders every day. They want us to learn from those mistakes. Most importantly, I think Edmontonians voted last fall for doing things differently, for a transformational approach to development, for innovation, for confidence, and for bold thinking. All key values in building a great city. 
It's time to deliver what citizens expect, and I intend to stay strong on our vision for the Blatchford development. Now, in parallel, we're also seeing the city's continued quest for sustainability taking further shape. And we are developing a comprehensive transportation system. We're steadily building out our light rail system with the long-term goal of six lines crossing Edmonton. And I'm pleased to be able to tell you that last night, uh, Edmonton City Council approved the next key stage of approval to move ahead with the $1.8 billion expansion of our light rail system from right around here to the southeast part of our city, which is wonderful. The, sure, <laughs> we're happy about it too. Now to give you a little history, currently the Capitol Line runs from northeast through downtown and on to the southwest, and I hope you have a chance to ride the system while you're here. The northbound uh, Metro Line's first leg is scheduled to open later this year. And we're waiting uh, confirmation from the provincial and federal governments, but we have a good understanding that all of the dollars are in place. But council made the commitment to apply the municipal dollars to go ahead with that, uh, that LRT line to the southeast. So this significant expansion of our light rail transit network is a testament to the strength of our partnership with the federal and provincial governments. And most importantly, it demonstrates the commitment and vision of all three orders of government to the effective movement of citizens in fast growing, denser urban centers and the lessening of traffic congestion on our roads. So on behalf of my city council colleagues, I really want to reiterate our thanks and gratitude to our provincial elected uh, and federal elected representatives for their support as Edmonton builds towards a more livable and resilient city. Longer terms are in place to extend the Valley Line and to the west and the Metro Line northwest to the city of St. Albert. And we also envision an eastward extension towards Sherwood Park and adding to both ends of the existing Capital Line. Bottom line, Edmontonians riding trains and buses translates to fewer single occupant vehicles on our roadways, reducing greenhouse gases, air pollution, and traffic congestion, which is why LRT is critical to a low carbon future for Edmonton. Ladies and gentlemen, when I look at Edmonton's environmental accomplishments spanning 30 years, it is clear to me that we have the experience, the culture, and as I referenced earlier, the attitude to move ahead. As a city that has done things first before, let's not shy away from the leadership and opportunity inherent in the energy and climate change challenges of the 21st century. The path we travel in the coming years will embrace three approaches. First, we need to concentrate on avoiding wasteful and unnecessary energy use in our homes, our businesses, and our municipal operations, and in the way we design our city. Avoiding unnecessary use in the first place is the easiest and most cost-effective thing any community can do. Our second approach is to improve energy efficiency in our buildings, vehicles, and industrial processes by using the most energy efficient technologies possible and by investing in research and development that will push technology to new levels and create new opportunity. The good news is that many cost effective energy efficiency solutions exist today. It's simply a matter of applying them more widely. Our third approach is to find ways of replacing high carbon energy sources like coal with lower carbon sources like natural gas and better yet with zero carbon uh, renewable energy sources. And in fact, Edmonton is really well positioned to exploit solar potential partly because when it's cold here, solar panels actually perform really, really well uh, because the temperature helps improve their efficiency. Um, so just in closing, ladies and gentlemen, we're at a time in history when the world's most innovative communities are striving to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels and build post-carbon economies. We in Edmonton and Alberta are impacting a part of this movement with your help here today, and the world is watching us. While we continue to play a lead role in developing Alberta's natural resource industries, at the same time we'll be, we will be transitioning Edmonton to a low-carbon energy sustainable future. These two paths are not opposed. Rather, they reflect the pragmatic thinking of an energy city and an energy province that understands the essential need for fossil fuels in the world's current energy mix, but at the same time know that the world and energy cities like Edmonton must find ways to transition away from carbon. Personally, I'm excited about the challenges and the opportunities that are before us. We don't have all of the answers going forward, just like we didn't have all of the answers when we were facing a landfill crisis in 1987.
but perhaps more importantly, what we do have is an established culture of sustainability and the collective willpower that is needed to take on the energy and climate change challenges of the 21st century. So when we eventually reach that low carbon, energy efficient future, somewhere in the middle of this century, we'll look back in 2014 and wonder what was all the fuss about. That's what we hope. Thank you very much. This is the most global of issues, yet city governments are the most local of governments. I mean, can municipalities make a difference uh, in this space? Well, I think they already have. Um, I because I think the conversation about climate change in Canada started at the municipal level. It was the Partners for Climate Protection, uh, the uh, International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, uh, uh, and um, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities who were talking about climate change more than 20 years ago in Canada before it was on the radar, at least publicly, of provincial and federal governments. So it was municipal leaders that learned about this and started talking about it and started and, and really helped start the public conversation. So, you know, as the order of government with eight cents of the tax dollar, our capacity is limited to solve all of these challenges, and our, our mandate around environmental protection is really limited to our communities. But we can be champions, and I think uh, municipal leaders for a long time have been. And so that's first and foremost where we, uh, where we have played a role, and I think we'll continue to play a role. So to give you one example of that, um, I'm privileged to sit around a table um, of uh, the big city mayors in the country and so there are 22 of us that uh, if we're all around the table represent two-thirds of the population of the country so that's an important table to be at and at uh, the last meeting of the this group we uh, commissioned some work to look at what will the costs to our large cities be of climate change adaptation in the event that mitigation strategies don't succeed. And obviously there are a variety of different scenarios, but when you start adding up what uh, the sea level communities are going to have to do about sea level rise and what communities like ours that are affected by uh, frost and frost heaving on the one hand uh, and more severe storms in the, in the summers on the other hand, um, you know, those impacts are considerable when it comes to having to resize our drainage system for, you know, we've had, I think, three one and two hundred year storms in the last ten years, mm -hmm. which tells you the scale needs to be recalibrated. It also tells you something may be changing. But if we look from a risk management point of view, we know those costs out there are considerable. So, so municipal leaders are going to continue to, to drive that, uh, that conversation nationally. And then uh, I think we have the opportunity, as we're doing today, to, uh, to promote further conversation locally as well, and then to, to lead by example. So whether it's energy efficiency in our buildings, whether it's planning communities that, uh, that are more efficient in terms of uh, where their energy comes from through district energy and renewable energy, or more efficient uh, in terms of transportation access that is uh, less energy intensive for residents and so on and so forth, we can promote a form of urban development that we know is going to be less energy intensive and help therefore contribute to reducing, uh, reducing our emissions. So there are things we can do. The Fathers of Confederation were many things, but the clairvoyant was not among them. They could have never anticipated that 80% of the population would be, would be urban and, and that cities would be relegated to kind of the orphans. Of, uh, of, of confederation. Do cities need more tools? Do we have to engage a conversation that sees feds and provinces starting to download some responsibilities, including fiscal capacity, so that cities can deal with exactly the kind of problems you're talking about? Well, our standard line is that they have downloaded lots of responsibilities on us. They just haven't given us For the welfare. money to deal with them. But, um, and so, but you know, we're we're privileged in Alberta right now, actually, to to be having some of that conversation with our provincial government, uh, with the ob with the objective of producing a city charter that that uh, starts first and foremost with the recognition of the roles and responsibilities that, that large communities have. And at this point, the focus has been primarily on uh, the social side in terms of some of the challenges that accumulate in large cities and some of the kind of infrastructure that we build that, in our case, you know, Edmonton is a service center for northern Alberta. And so for us to, uh, you know, as host for that, it, that comes with a lot of benefits. It, other com it also comes with some challenges that we would argue are unfunded in a variety of different areas. So the, the door is open to conversation with our province right now in a way that recognizes that Section 92 of the Constitution didn't outline very much detail about, uh, about where municipalities fall. So I think 
whether we would wind up in the position of, uh, of, of regulators on, on some of these issues. There's some precedent for things like building code to be um, uh, handed down to municipalities in British Columbia, for example. And, um, you know, we're not at that stage in the conversation yet. I, I think it's best if these measures are consistent across the province rather than having um, the regulatory environment get fragmented for something like building codes on a municipality by municipality basis. So, um, but at least the province is open to conversation, which is good. When um, people talk about a low carbon future, I mean, it's often kind of the combined with the end of progress uh, conversation, you know, that we really have to scale back, people have to do less. In our, you talked about the opportunities. In fact, I think you went as far in, in your remarks to say that there are tremendous social and economic advantages of, for cities that are first movers in, uh, in this space. Expand on that notion. What, what kind of social and economic advantage? Well, you, you can look at it two ways, and I think the first way, which often gets interpreted as overly pessimistic, is to take a risk management approach and say, okay, if we do nothing, and we've modeled some of this in our uh, our energy transition strategy, which um, the draft uh, some draft material has come before council previously, and we had a, a fairly innovative um, citizen assembly brought together, a citizen panel. Uh, so doing some participatory democracy around this in partnership with the University of Alberta and the Alberta Climate Dialogue Project, and so we had citizens taking a look at some of these different energy scenario futures, and uh, the do nothing option we could assume that everything will be rosy forever except that there are a bunch of risks if you do nothing. There are risks if you make changes as well, but they come with a lot of opportunities that have to do with resiliency. So if you reduce your over-reliance on one particular source of, uh, of energy, take coal for example, you know, we're very, very heavily dependent on, uh, on coal right now for our electricity generation. Uh, if there's a regulatory change, and there is a regulatory change coming, then you have to adapt. You have to make a change somehow. So what's that going to mean? Well, some new power plants are going to have to be built, and there's an opportunity, uh, you know, that's an economic development opportunity as, as that technology is, new technology is invested in. Um, but that's, that's just making the change with solutions that exist today. I think the really exciting part is uh, for researchers and uh, creators in Edmonton, and we have this great ecosystem of innovation here from our universities and technical institutions through to you know a long tradition of research and development that helped open up the oil sands in the first place and continues to improve the environmental uh, and cost performance of resource uh, of the resource economy in the north so innovation's always been the imperative it is going to continue to be the imperative in order to be able to do business in the future cheaper cleaner greener faster and safer and if Edmonton innovators and Edmonton companies can be at the forefront of that work not solving every problem in the world but solving a few key problems and exporting that technology and that knowledge to the world that's how this can be an economic development opportunity as opposed to just something that happens to you over time I I think Edmontonians very much would like to be a part of the, uh, the adaptation and technological innovation that's going to be required to meet these challenges. And the more of that innovation we have, the more efficiency that is generated out there in the world, the more bang we can get for any unit of energy that we consume, whatever its source. None of this is easy, and none of it comes, uh, comes, comes quickly. Let's assume, just for sake of hypotheticals here, that you run another term. What's Edmonton going to look like? I'm not making any announcements today. <laughs> What's Edmonton? What, 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 what would you like Edmonton to look like in five years? I mean, you've talked about the changes to, to LRT. What would be different for the citizens of this, uh, this city? Well, when you build LRT, obviously it, it opens up the opportunity to build different kinds of communities in Edmonton. Um, I mean, outside of downtown, Edmonton is a primarily low-density um, residential yeah. kind of form. And from a competitiveness point of view, in terms of attracting and retaining the full mix of labor and, and people that we need here, we need to be able to offer a great urban lifestyle as well. We offer a really good suburban lifestyle. We need to be able to offer a great urban lifestyle in more pockets around the city. So LRT allows you to, to build those town centers and uh, you know that, that line I was talking about earlier will open in about five years and with it we understand there are a, a number of potential private investments that will be underway. Now these large developments, you know, building out essentially a whole town center with uh, you know three to five thousand people, that probably takes more than five years. But um, as we see that 
that type of development taking hold in Edmonton. That's good for us in terms of, uh, like I said, attraction and retention of people, urban vibrancy, but obviously there's very, very significant um, environmental upsides to, to the lifestyle that you know, people living in those developments tend to, tend to drive less and their, uh, their energy footprint tends to be lower as well because because uh, of their lifestyle, it's more walkable and so on. So, um, so we'll see more of that choice evolving in Edmonton, and uh, there are lots of demographic shifts happening in the housing market too that support that trend in other cities. So we think Edmonton can join that that urbanization trend. Certainly, I think some of the other uh, things that that do need to happen though is, um, you know, I think we do need a, a provincial consensus. Uh, on the policy approach to this, and I hope that can evolve over the next five years, and that from it would come a provincial scale energy efficiency program for industry, a provincial scale uh, energy efficiency program for residential and commercial buildings, and then, uh, you know, in the context of that, we can continue to provide leadership at the community level as well on energy efficiency and on, on uh, renewable energy uptake. So these are all elements of our energy transition strategy, which Council will. Uh, we'll look at later this year and hopefully that will be well underway in terms of its implementation. And then continued leadership from the city in terms of building uh, buildings that, that are highly energy efficient uh, in terms of our uh, right sizing of our fleet and in terms of uh, the purchase of green power for example uh, and street lighting conversion and things like that. So things that continue to reduce our, our energy consumption as a municipal or operation that demonstrate leadership and commitment. A godless Torontonian would suggest that the elephant in the room is that the city of Edmonton and the economy of Edmonton is very much driven by and, and interlinked with the fossil fuel, fuel industry. I mean, does that fundamental fact present some real challenges or conversely some opportunities for Edmonton that are unique? Well, I'd point out to the Torontonian that their economy is dependent on the same thing, that it's a national economy that is all dependent on, on, on a resource uh, extraction model at the, at the, for the time being, and that there will continue to be markets for that, and that our imperative, as I said earlier, has to be how do we continue to do that work in a way that is continually cheaper, cleaner, greener, faster, and safer. Innovations are imperative, and the whole country should be a part of meeting that. So whether it's research happening at the University of Alberta, or research happening at Waterloo, or innovation from a company based in St. John's that helps us uh, meet the world's expectation for higher and higher environmental performance in our resource economy, that should be a nation-building project rather than picking on each other, which, which hasn't added a whole lot to the conversation. So we recognize that in order to have the social license to continue to do business, that business is going to have to be greener and cleaner and cheaper and faster and safer over time. We just like the whole country to get together on that project because I think we'll be a lot more prosperous if we work together on that. Well said, Mayor uh, Iveson. I want to thank you very much on behalf of everyone in the room. Real pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you.